<laughs> hey there, Ryan here, and it's finally time for the third episode of the Project Keg Rocket video series, which is about the airframe of Keg Rocket, the liquid rocket that's powered by beer kegs. This video is going to be kind of tricky because the airframe is obviously a large aspect of the rocket and there's a lot of detailed things going on here and I've got a lot more footage over the course of building this thing than what's going to fit in a 15 minute or so video. So this is really just going to be an overview of what everything is, some of the choices we made while designing it and how it's all gone together. So. All rockets experience forces, and forces, aside from government budget cuts, are probably the number one cause of death for rockets. Keg rocket is essentially a flying structure which needs to withstand all sorts of forces from aerodynamic to inertial, and needs to be able to withstand the resultant compression, bending, and tension from things like flight or transportation, which can be severe, and also importantly, needs to provide a place to mount and house all the other things that the rocket needs to fly and protect those things from the airstream. So let's go over the rocket from tip to tail and talk about the plan there. Starting from the very nose of the rocket, we've got an 8 inch diameter filament wound fiberglass nose cone which will punch through the air with a sudsy payload inside. Just after that is the parachute bay which is also fiberglass. When keg rocket reaches its maximum altitude, the whole nose section will be blown off by explosive charges revealing the parachutes stored inside. More on that in the next episode. Just below that is the avionics bay, which is where a custom-built flight computer called Designated Driver will live. Unlike the rest of the rocket, this is all made from traditional tube, bulkhead, and epoxy construction techniques that are common in the hobby. We've also incorporated a cutting-edge aerospace cellulose composite material called plywood. Renewable. Where I live in the Pacific Northwest, it's often too cold and wet outside for paint and epoxy to cure properly. This is so much of a problem in fact that I actually drove all the parts down to Southern California with me while visiting some family to get those curables done right. I wanted the rocket's color scheme to be reminiscent of a shimmering glass of the amber stuff but not be some tacky urine color, so I figured that orange was the next best thing. I went with a metallic burnt orange from the auto parts store and put a ton of the glossiest clear coat I could find on top to give it a translucent appearance. And honestly, I think it's beautiful. I sure hope it doesn't get scratched. It is. The rest of the rocket is all metal. Now, in my opinion, Keg Rocket presents as a sort of scrappy, but also secretly kind of clever engineering project and for that, a lot of the construction techniques we've chosen center around low cost and high availability. So for now, you're not going to see too many things like load-bearing composites or super alloy materials or what have you. Instead, Keg Rocket is held together primarily by aluminum beam-like structural members. In aircraft terms, I'm going to call these spars, although it's probably more of a launderon technically. Anyways, the spars are the backbone of the rocket, and there's also perpendicular elements which I call ribs, and chances are anything else is a bracket of sorts. Almost all these parts are cut and bent from 5052H32 aluminum sheet. It's not as strong as the ubiquitous 6061T6 alloy, but it's cheap and especially easy to bend without cracking. This is important because forming or bending has been employed extensively in the construction here. If designed correctly, forming can radically improve a thin section part's ability to resist loads, which is why it's a key aspect of Keg Rocket's construction. Because they're made from sheets, they're inherently thin and light, while the bends make them stiff and strong. I think it's also appropriate because even the kegs themselves happen to be these beautiful drawn and formed sheet metal parts. The forward airframe serves as a transition between the 8 inch diameter nose section to the 11 inch diameter LOX keg. A question I get asked a lot is why the nose section tapers down to a smaller diameter than the rest of the rocket. Personally, I just think it looks interesting and it also draws attention to the ridiculous kegs below. It's also a common size for off the shelf fiberglass rocket components which were used in the nose to save some time. I machined the nose mounting bulkhead out of a beefy pre-trim plate and designed a manual bend notch into the spars so that I could dial in the transition angle just right and lock it in with an angled bracket. So 
So how do we mount these spars? I wanted to avoid significant modifications to the kegs because we've already put a ton of effort into modifying them to be tanks. The rolled lip of the kegs are also somewhat irregularly shaped, so I came up with a spar design that wraps around the lip and fastens to the inside of the keg skirt for a small amount of adjustability. This does require just a few mounting holes to be drilled, so I created a plywood fixture that accepts a drill jig to make sure the holes are evenly spaced and axially aligned. Yes, even the holes are angled to pass through the center line of the rocket. In order to make sure that the flat spar has a good grip on the round keg, I machined some rounded shims out of phenolic sheet that go between the spar and the keg. I also painstakingly made these nut bars out of aluminum rod with angled and threaded holes to match. Next in the stack is the LOX keg itself, and believe it or not, this is a super normal thing to do. Most liquid rockets use the propellant tanks themselves as part of their main load structure. Although big tanks can be quite thin and flimsy on their own, the pressure that's going to be inside them pulls the material taut to resist buckling to a huge extent. Exactly like how it's incredibly difficult to crush a sealed beverage can compared to an empty one. Combined with the fact that it would be really sad for keg rockets kegs, the whole point, to be hidden under some other airframe structure, it makes perfect sense to incorporate them directly into it. Yet another example of a real-world technical phenomenon that actually fits the bit quite well. We've been having a lot of those on this project. Between the LOX keg and the ethanol keg is, you guessed it, the inter-keg section. It's mainly a space for plumbing, and this is actually where I started when designing the rocket and built outwards from there. After that is the aft section. Aft section works hard. Not only does it contain a bunch of propulsion equipment, it's a mount for the engine and fins while also being a tapered boat tail shape. This reduces drag and, more importantly, makes the rocket look more rockety. It's built very similarly to the forward section, except it's also got some extended mounting brackets for the fins and a very strong thrust waffle to mount the engine to. I had almost all our airframe parts made by Sendcut Send, who make the sheet metal process almost too easy not to use. In fact, I relied on this ecosystem so heavily for Keg Rocket that Sendcut Send actually noticed and asked me if they could reproduce the airframe to show off their services at a big trade show called SEMA last year. It warms my heart to think that there's a Keg Rocket serial number 2 out there somewhere. Sheet metal parts are usually run in batches, so it doesn't cost much more to buy 10 as it does 4. This makes it very easy to be hardware rich without breaking the bank. Now this doesn't totally capture the actual loads that Keg Rocket will encounter, but I did make a spark crusher out of a 2x4 and pneumatic cylinder to see how easily they would buckle. I maxed out my pneumatic cylinder at this load, so in an ideal scenario, it's at least as strong as that. The thing which I'm actually a little more concerned about is tension. This can happen when the rocket experiences bending, and since the spars hook around and fasten to the inside of the keg, the tensile load path has to travel around the C slot, which puts this area under a lot of bending stress. To counter this, I've added a notch pre-compressor feature, which transfers some tension through this screw directly into the main body of the spar. We also have these bolt-on side plates, which reinforce the area, and this architecture is common to all the keg interfaces. By the way, speed holes, speed holes everywhere. They make it lighter and look cooler. Pretty much everything is bolted together with stainless locking fasteners because I don't like rust and the rocket will have to survive over a thousand miles on the road without shaking apart. So that's a bit of an info blast on the airframe of Keg Rocket and I've been really excited for this episode because it's where the rocket really starts to take shape and soon we'll be focusing on the guts that actually make the rocket work like the recovery system, the fluid systems, the aerodynamic stuff, etc. Of course, I want to thank Amygda Launch for sponsoring this project, as well as our friends in the description for helping out as well. Even though we're taking a pretty scrappy approach, the stuff still costs a lot and every little bit helps things happen. Otherwise, I really appreciate the views, comments, and enthusiasm. I'm just stoked by how positive and constructive the engagement has been so far, and for that I'm extremely grateful. Anyways, I'm Ryan Callahan, this is Project Keg Rocket, and thanks for watching.
Okay. It, it's not fod if it's delicious, right? 